Getting to know you, getting to feel free and easy. <laughs> when I am with you, getting to know what to say. Haven't you noticed? Suddenly I'm bright and breezy because of all the beautiful and new. That was from the classic show, The King and I, now starring Tony Award nominee and Broadway veteran Marin Maisie as Anna at Lincoln Center. Marin last appeared on The Great White Way in Bullets Over Broadway and received Tony nominations for her performances in Kiss Me, Kate. So in love with you, Ragtime and Passion. And it was while performing in another Broadway revival a year ago that she got the news that she'd been diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer. She valiantly fought for her recovery through an excruciating and frightening year of chemo and surgery, and she's now thankfully in remission. For most women, there is no effective way to screen for cancer in the ovaries. This is one reason why it's important for all women to be aware of the risk factors for this illness and to stay sensitive to changes that might be symptoms of it. She joins us now to talk about what other women can learn from her heroic battle. And Mara, it's nice to see you again. So good to see you too, uh, Jack. I want to talk about The King and I in a few moments. Okay. Because it's such a delightful show. And, it is. And, and you are so perfect for the role. Thank there. you. And you can tell you're glorying in that role now. <laughs> I am. <laughs> but let's go back to, to the, the, the story of your diagnosis. Yes. You uh, and I, have I've heard you talk about this before. Right. And, and you, you talk about the, the coincidence of the time and what you were doing at the time. Yes. How did the diagnosis come about? How did you learn about it? And what were you doing? I was doing uh, the musical Zorba, written by John Kander and Fred Ebb, and playing the leader in that. And as we started rehearsal, I started to fill up with what I now know was fluid. But at the time, I was just bloating, which was very odd for me, something that really never happens to me. It's a very short rehearsal time, so kind of every day I was filling up a little more and going to rehearsal and feeling very odd. And uh, by the end of, of the week, I was on the phone with my internist and saying, this is strange. And so I actually ended up going in to see him two days before we opened. And he did ran some tests and um, called me and said, uh, there are some things going on. And he said, it looks like you have some growths in your ovaries. That was on Tuesday, the 5th of May, which was our dress rehearsal day. And then on the 6th of May, Wednesday, the 6th of May, <laughs> the day I will never forget, I went to Memorial Sloan Kettering and spent the day with my amazing surgeon, Dr. Abu Rustam, learned that I indeed had ovarian cancer. And uh, we uh, made a, a plan for what, what would be the next sort of many, many months of my life. But I went to the show that night. I went from Memorial Sloan Kettering and I walked to City Center and I went to my dressing room and put on my makeup and put on my wig and uh, walked out on stage and I start the show and I sang, so I said, listen to me and I sing. Life is what you do while you are waiting to die. Life is how the time goes by. And who would ever have thought those Fred Ebb lyrics would be telling for the next journey of my life? I was struck by one thing. I had the opportunity, the great pleasure of presenting you an award on behalf of the Cancer Support Community. Yes, a couple of months wonderful ago. organization. And you were so inspiring there. You're right, it is a wonderful organization, but you were so inspiring to the people there. And, and I was struck when I was looking at some of the background things, uh, putting together the introduction for you, the fact that it, you had gone through this such a difficult year. We talked about chemotherapy and, and right. surgery. And you referred to it, you didn't refer to it as chemotherapy, you referred to it as healing I referred therapy. to it as healing therapy. Why? Yeah. Well, I couldn't think of, um, you know, people refer to chemotherapy as poison. Now, when it's being infused in your body every week for many hours, I couldn't sit there and think, there's poison going into my blood right now. I, I, what was happening was, if I didn't have this chemotherapy, I wouldn't be alive. It was saving my life. So 
there was no way I could think of it as poison. I thought of it as healing therapy. It was a healing elixir that was going through my body and it was saving my life. And th that's, just how, that's just how I have viewed it. And I, I, I encourage people not to think of it as that sort of poison. Yes, there are, yes, there are major side effects that happen with it, but if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. So there's just no way that I could think of it as a negative. It's, it had to be something that was positive and that was healing me. And, you know, the two, t the, two, the two therapies that I was getting, one was made from tree bark and one is made from platinum. So they are of the earth. So the earth was healing me and coursing through my veins every week for 24 weeks, you know. So that's just, that was just how I had to do it. Great optimism bringing into that. Tell me about the decision to get back on stage so quickly in The King and I. I got a call on January 7th of this year asking if I would like to replace Kelly O'Hara in The King and I. And I had actually just seen the, the production. I hadn't seen it because of everything that had gone on. Kelly and I are friends and I wanted to see her in her Tony Award winning performance. And so I took my mom over Christmas and I just was blown away by not only her per performance and, and uh, she was doing it with a wonderful actor, Hoon Lee at the time, but the production was just extraordinary. And I, it made me see King and I in a whole other way. So I just sat there and loved it. So when I received this call, I had no, I didn't even know Kelly was leaving. I had no idea, but I could honestly say, oh my God, I would love to do that show. But I, the next day I was going to my oncologist to find out if I was in remission or not. And I said to my agent, we just have to wait a day to see what, what is. And I went January 8th and found out I was in remission. So, you know, full speed ahead. So I, I just feel like the universe was, was working for me to, to get me back on stage as quickly as I, I, I could. And uh, so that not only for me is it healing and joyful to be working in, in this beautiful production and now singing, you know, whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune so no one will suspect I'm afraid. Um, it's such, the bookend of the year is just quite astonishing. And it was basically almost a year to the day that I started my first performance for The King and I through my diagnosis. So the whole thing has just been so extraordinary for me. And uh, it, it just continues to be full of joy. And, uh, and like I said, getting back to work was just so, so very, very important. We tend to look for messages in the various chapters of our lives. Yes. And I know you've become such a, 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 a spokesperson uh, for other women who right. are experiencing the same challenges that you experience. What, what is a message that you've taken from all of this that you could pass on to somebody else? Well, the messages of just sort of really knowing your body and, and knowing the changes that happen in your body, those sort of things. Um, but the message that I, I want to talk about is, is trying to put a different skew on the word cancer and chemotherapy and the things that, you know, I think when people hear cancer, uh, especially ovarian cancer, <laughs> they tend to go, oh, no, or, oh, you know, no, you can't. And I've said to people, you can't react to me like that. You can't do that. It has to be, you know, you know I want... I want it to be, a, a, it's not a positive thing, obviously, that, that you're diagnosed with cancer, but there are so many things that can be done now, and that's, that's what's important. And getting, getting treatment, getting treatment, getting second opinions, getting going, going to places that you feel confident, being confident with your doctors, um, really loving them and, and, and having them understand where you are and coming from and what you need, those sort of things have been invaluable to me. I also tested positive for the BRCA2 gene mutation. So that's something that I really wanted to get out there and, and make more awareness of the, the genetic testing for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, because it is not available to everyone. It's an expensive, it's a blood test and it's very expensive. And if I had had it, uh, it would have shown that I, I had the mutation and probably I would have had my ovaries removed. Um, I have wonderful doctors, there's no blame. I'm not placing any blame on anybody. The, the, uh, I didn't really fit the profile. Um, there was breast cancer in my family, but on my father's side, it was my father's mother. Usually they seem to tend to, it's the mother's side, or that's a misnomer. There's a lot of things out there that are, uh, the, the profiling and those sort of things needs to, needs to widen so that 
all women and also men. Men, everybody has a BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. It's a cancer suppressor. Those are, those are genes in our genome system. And a mutation in a man or a woman can, uh, can increase your risk for cancer. And it's, it's only passed down. And it's passed down every generation. So it doesn't skip a generation. So um, my father's mother died of breast cancer. My father died of prostate cancer uh, eight years ago. But he was never tested. So, but he would have been a carrier because when I was finally tested, my mother then, after I tested positive, my mother tested and she was not, not the carrier. It's, so I know it was my dad's side of the family. So it, it's just finding out, and I really want women to be aware, women and men, of the cancer in their families, especially in their immediate families. And if there is breast, ovarian, prostate, sometimes colon also, um, that to get tested for this test, and it needs to be more available. Um, I also, we have to try and find a, uh, a test for ovarian cancer. There isn't one. There isn't one for early detection. And I went to my gynecologist like clockwork every year. In fact, I was just about to go to her when this all happened. It had just been less than a year since I'd had my last examination. And, um, I was having vaginal ultrasounds. I was having those things, um, but it wasn't detected. You know, so um, we've got to find a better, better way to, to find out. There is a blood test also for ovarian, the CA125. Anyway, I could go on and on about all of that, but <laughs> well, they are, it's they just are. about it's about people, you know, getting awareness out there, and uh, that's that's what that's one of that's another reason and another f thing that I feel it. King and I was such a gift so that I could start really talking about my story and hopefully helping other people. Well, they're compelling messenger <laughs> messages and you're a marvelous messenger. Thank you. To get them to us. We are also delighted you're back on stage. It's Thank always you. a pleasure to talk to you, Mary. Thank you so much. You'd be well. Thanks. And for more information on ovarian cancer, please visit our website at metrofocus.org.